Hey, good morning, everybody. All right, we are glad you guys are here. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. This fine-looking gentleman right here is Mark Rowe. Can you guys welcome Mark? All right. Mark is the head of our security team here in our church, and so we wanted to take a couple minutes and just talk about what that means and why we have it. Um, this can be a little intense, so if you have really little kids, you may consider just kind of hanging out in the lobby for just a couple minutes, uh, just in case you're sensitive to that, because we're going to talk about some active shooter things and those kinds of things that happen. So just giving you a heads up as that as parents. So uh, every once in a while in our media, uh, you do hear about an attack on a place of worship. Uh, and so, Mark, how many of those attacks... Are well, you, in 2017, yeah. we don't have the 18 stats. There were 117 deaths in church, churches nationwide. And those deaths were um, homicide, suicide, or suspicious in nature. There were uh, 247 violent incidences in churches nationwide. And they were assault, aggravated assault, um, shootings, uh, domestic violence, and sexual assault. That kind of breaks down like one every day and a half uh, in a course of the year. That's a lot. So because of those incidences, and obviously they're, they're on the rise, uh, we believe our church needed a plan uh, on what to do if something like that were to happen here. Uh, so Mark has helped us come up with some really excellent steps on how to do that. And as we talk about what you would do uh, as a church person this morning if something like that were to happen, I want to just kind of preface this with the reason we're doing this. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is we believe that it's a biblical step to take. So Ecclesiastes says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Because this is a reality in our culture now, we have to be prepared. We have to take steps. Uh, so we're going to do that. The other thing that uh, the scriptures would say is the Apostle Paul uh, said that a church service should be done in an orderly manner. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're able to continue to do services in an orderly manner uh, without unnecessary interruptions and without some kind of chaos breaking loose. But also at the same time, so the second thing is because this is a new reality in our culture, we'd be wise to be prepared for that. And when you think about the things that happen in life, there's a whole host of other issues that go on that maybe will never happen, but we always prepare for them. We prepare for fire. Think about all the fire drills that we've had in our lives. Uh, when I grew up in the Midwest, like we had tornado drills where you go sit out in the hallway and put your hands over your head and then they change it to like put your butt in the air so that something fell hitting the butt and not the head, right? We had all those drills. We have evacuation drills. We have lockdown drills. Uh, we have all kinds of those things. So one of those things on fire drills, like you can obviously see in this room, we have three exits. Uh, I feel like a stewardess here kind of pointing you to these, these things. If there's ever a fire, what you do is you go out that door and you wait out here in the grass. It's a pretty simple step, right? So we want to make sure that when it comes to things like active shooters that you know what steps to take because that's obviously a very chaotic thing. So inside your bulletin, I'd like everybody to grab these. There's two inserts in there today. I want you to grab the first, bullet, the first insert out that says run, hide, fight. I'm going to let Mark talk a little bit about that. So this is what you would do if there was ever an incident that popped up in the, sh in the church with an active shooter. So go ahead and just walk us through this real fast. Okay, there's a, a national policy. It was developed by Department of Homeland Security, and it's called the Run, Hide, Fight Plan. Um, it's very simple. It's a very simple strategy on what to do if there's an active shooter. And this policy applies if you're here at church, if you're at the mall, you're at the library, you're in a restaurant. And it's this. You run, you hide, you fight. So if we have a shooter, first thing you should do when you go anywhere, you should know where the exits. If you ask my wife what I do when we go to a restaurant, I know where all the exits are, and I sit my back to the wall. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm paranoid or cautious, but I'm watching people as they come in. I want to know who's coming in. You should do the same thing when you go into a church. Know where the exits are. We have two here, at least. We have the ones in the back, and I guess there's none up there. So <laughs> if we have an active shooter in this church, um, I want you to head toward those, towards those exits. I want you to run. A, tar a moving target's a hard target. If the people with you don't want to go, then you leave them. I'm not talking about your children. <laughs> But if, if the other people in your row don't want to go, you leave. Um, if you're stuck at the door and people are having problems getting through the door, help them get through the door. Um, if you evacuate and you go out into the lobby and there's someone wounded on the floor, you don't stop to help them. You're going to walk by them. We'll have People will show up later that will help them, but you cannot stop and help them. If you have any questions about anything I say, see me in the back afterwards and I'll explain to you the logic behind it. 
Um, once you get outside, call 911. Um, one little boy just rebuked me. He says, well, you told, told him to call the police, but you didn't tell him to call the ambulance. Just so you know, if you call 911, the ambulance will be dispatched with the police. Keep your hands visible at all times. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So run, hide, fight. The second part of that say, is when hide. They, when they run, they should not run to no. kids. No. Uh, yeah, I forgot about that stuff. So your children here are the safest people in this building. We have the door at the, at the end of the hallway down there, and these doors will be locked and closed once the service starts. So if there's an active shooter, if they're shooting in that lobby, do not try to go and retrieve your ch child. You're, you're just going to get yourself hurt, and you're not going to be able to get them anyway. The doors are locked. The, the people will not open the door for you. That's how they're being trained. You're, you're going to do yourself a disservice. You're going to get injured, and you're not going to help your children. So if they're shooting out there, your children are safe, I promise you. You leave. You run out the door. The second phase of this run-hide fight plan is the hide. So if you're in the bathroom or you're in one of the children's ministry areas and you hear shooting, you hide. You lock the door. You turn the lights out. You silence your phone. That means silence your vibrate also on your phone. You can text 911 to someone, call police. We have a shooter in the church. But don't get on your phone. Turn the lights off. Get low to the ground. Try to find us some cover. Um, we don't have any block in the building, right? No. All right, so there's nothing in this building that will probably stop a pistol round. There's nothing in this building that will stop a rifle round. So if you're in these rooms, get low. Try to put a copier in front of you. Don't stand in front of the door, please, contrary to what the movies tell you, and just be quiet until the police come. Don't open the door until the police arrive. The third part of that is the, the fight. So let's just assume you can't run, you can't hide. What's your option? You fight. You fight with every being that you have. I'm not allowed to be specific. I got yelled at that. <laughs> but you be creative. There's weapons in here. You have chairs, your keys, your phone, um, fire extinguisher. Whatever you have to do with extreme prejudice, you fight like your life depends on it because it does. And your children are dependent on you. I think it's important to know that. I mean, like, we go back to when we did fire drills as kids. Like, I said, if you can't get out the door, you take whatever you can and you knock that glass out. You climb out. Um, you need to know that as a church. Like, if it comes to that place and you need to fight, you have permission to do that. These people were cowards. If they weren't cowards, they'd, they'd attack a military base or a police department. We don't have weapons here for the most part. So they're looking for soft targets. So if bad guy comes in here, you fight. You fight from different, you fight from different angles. If bad guy's here, don't everybody get in a line and go like this. You have people attack from this side, and you have people attack from that side. And you do whatever it takes to disable or or stop the guy. So this is what we do, run, hide, fight, because it'll take how long for the police to finally get <laughs> well, called and get here? The politicians are going to tell you the police will be here in three or four minutes. Well, unless there's a Dunkin' Donut in the parking lot, the police aren't going to be here. Well, we, do have, uh, we do have munchkins yeah. in the lobby. The police aren't going to be here. You know, It's going to be over, guys, by the time the police get here. The New Zealand shooting, I have the video for that. We'll be showing it next week at Calvary. Um, I have seven and a half minutes of the shooting. The police never respond. Seven and a half minutes. I can do a lot of damage in the seven and a half minutes. So we are on our own. So we'll talk about recruiting later. The last part of this is once you're in a safe location and the police arrive, um, the closest SWAT team, you know, everybody knows what a SWAT team is? The closest SWAT team is the state police teams unit. They're very complex, they're a very uh, squared away group of people. They're not gonna get here in, within 20 minutes. They're in Buna. By the time they assemble and get here, it's done. Violent PD will respond. Um, they are required by law to make entry. If the shooting is still going, they have to make entry. They're not going to wait for a SWAT team. They're not going to wait for backup. Ideally, they'll come in with groups of four people. They are going to pass over wounded people. So if you're wounded, they are not going to stop and help you. They are going to try to go to the threat, stop the threat, and then follow-up people will come and help you. So once you go outside and the police respond and the shooting is done, what do you do? Number one is you drop your phone, any, anything, in your, anything in your hands you get rid of. You, you don't want to reach in your pockets. You want to put your hands here. You want to put your hands up like this and like this. Why? Because you don't want to get shot. You want to reach in your pockets, and the police are going to be nervous. They're, they're going to come in, and they see you reach in your pocket. They're going to think you're the bad guy. You will be treated as a suspect. You will be spoken to harshly. They'll probably, yeah, I would. They're probably going to yell at you and tell you to get whatever on the ground. Do what they say, because they don't know who the bad guy is, so, they're gonna, so they sort it all out. 
That's the way it's going to be. So listen to what they say. Don't be taking photos of the cops. Don't be pointing at them. Don't try to volunteer any service. Just shut up. Be quiet. And um, <laughs> do what they tell you to do. It's the Mark Rowe coming out of me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. If you know me, then you'll, you'll understand. Right. Well, and I mean, I understand, Mark, because these, these things can be, they're obviously full of chaos. They're very uh, intense uh, and very wild. So, um, so similar to a fire drill, like if a fire happened, you know to get out the doors. If a tornado happens, you know to go inside to a safe and secure place where it's uh, you know small and there aren't windows around. If there's an active shooter, now you know what to do. Run, hide, fight. Um, so we wanted to give you those details and those parameters. Uh, so we have an excellent security team here, uh, which Mark leads. And uh, so Mark, uh, from security team standpoint, what do you need from the church body? Okay, I need volunteers. Um, we've been running the security here for about a year and a half. No one's quitting, but guy, we need help. Uh, I mean, the way it works is if you if you volunteer for a team, I'll put you on the service that you work. You'll work one service. When I say work, you're not getting paid. I'm not getting paid. No, that's right. right that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm not getting paid, you're not getting paid. <laughs> so you'll you'll volunteer one Sunday per month. Um, I'll put you on the list. Um, Got my train of thought. I, so I need volunteers. I need anybody that's willing to help, um, any man or woman. I just need hairy and scary people. Yeah, I did say <laughs> hairy and scary. <laughs> anybody that's willing to help me. Um, mm -hmm. Number two is I need you to be observant. Okay, too many people in America walk, walk around like this with blinders on. If you see someone in this church that is that something's wrong, if it looks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it's probably a duck. Someone comes in dressed all in black with a black hoodie on. There might be a problem here. Let one of us know. Keep your eyes open. Men, I ask that all the men sit on the outside of the pews. What? Pews? Seats, chairs, Seats, whatever. whatever. <laughs> Why do I want that? Because if someone's trying to hurt Pastor Chris and I'm trying to intervene and, and I'm getting my butt kicked, I want the biggest, baddest guy out of the pew as quick as possible to help me. So I Thank want Thank you the for that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I want, yeah, I want, the, <laughs> I want the men here, okay? No offense to the women, but if it's going to be a man helping me or a woman, I want a man helping me. Uh, you, you can get mad at me later. Um, <laughs> Well, there's a few women out here. They're, they're flexing their muscles right now. Like, don't count me out. <laughs> where's, where's Dara? I'm sure Dara's all angry right now. Um, where are you? I tried to work you into my... I put you in a headlock. Um, and I need you to be... That's two, right? I said two yeah, things. that's two. And I the need third you one. to be gracious. This is a volunteer ministry that we do. We're going to make mistakes. There's do Doors are going to be locked when it's inconvenient. Just be gracious with us. Try to help us out. Um, and just pray for us. That's right. awesome. Can we pray for you right now? Yeah, sure. All right. If you guys would be willing to reach out your hand, uh, let me place my hand on Mark's shoulder here. There's just a great team of guys and ladies that blend in with us to help keep us safe. So, Jesus, I want to thank you for the initiative and the hard work that this team puts in. Uh, they really want to make sure that worship of you happens without interruption. So continue to endow them with strength and awareness. I ask God that you would fill up their, their empty slots with great volunteers and that you would help this team continue to move forward uh, and help us all be safe and able to worship freely uh, in front of you today and any other Sunday. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Mark. All right, so, so that's one thing that we wanted to talk about. So that's something that uh, if darkness of the world ever came here, now we have a plan and you know what to do. Uh, but one of the other things that we do as a church uh, to make sure that that darkness decreases and doesn't have to come here is we go out and we bring Jesus to the world. So we're going to talk a little bit about taste of mission. So this is one of those opportunities where we get to go out and engage what's out there in the world. Uh, so in your bulletins, the other insert that you have, you might have saw the tables that were out here in the lobby uh, where you can sign up for those things. So you can sign up in two ways. One, you can sign up at lfachurch.org slash info, uh, or two, you can sign up in the lobby afterwards. So in two weeks, when we have Taste of Mission Sunday, we're going to have one service at 9 o'clock. Uh, the Glastown Church is going to join us for that. Uh, so just making sure that you guys know that. And then over here is Mindy. Mindy, can you raise your hand? Mindy is leading a ministry called Awana. You got to keep it up. I don't think everybody got their head turned around. So this is Mindy. She's the Awana leader. Uh, if What's the age of the kids? Is it 11 and under? Okay, 12 and under. So if your kids are 12 and under, this is an excellent ministry for you to, to put your kids in so that they can memorize the Word of God. That's the main focus of Awana. So we're letting you know that's happening. It's starting in July and runs through August. Uh, so just letting you know that that's happening. All right, so we're going to begin our service today, uh, and we're going to do a different style of service than what you're used to. 
Uh, so we're going to walk through some different movements today. The kids are going to stay with us for the first two movements, and then we'll dismiss those kids. Uh, so last week we started a series on encountering God and what does it look like to engage God in his presence. And so today we're going to start off with a verse. And I'm going to give you just a moment to, uh, we'll give you guys, go ahead and put that verse up for me. I want to give you a moment to just rest. That was a lot of information that we just covered. It might have been a little unsettling. Uh, it's a new reality for us, but now we need to turn our attention towards God. Uh, so when it says in the Psalms, it says, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. It's a significant verse. So I want, to ima I want you to imagine yourself sitting by the edge of a real quiet stream this morning. Just nice green space, a nice quiet spot where God could come and just sit down next to you and just talk with you. So I want to give you a minute to do that. I want to give you a minute where you would set your heart in a posture where you would say, I want to hear the voice of the Lord this morning. I want to encounter his presence. I want to know him because that's what we want for you this morning. So come and listen. Come and hear. See, your ears are always on even when you're sleeping. So let's set the phones down. Let's set the bulletins down. Set your coffee down. Just take a minute, be still before the Lord, and ask him to speak to you today. So take a minute, and then we'll begin our time. spiritual kingdom lies all about us, enclosing us, embracing us. It's all together within the reach of our inner selves, waiting for us to recognize it. God himself is here, waiting our response to his presence. A.W. Tozer wrote those words uh, about 75 years ago, and because this is true, we are taking some weeks as a church because it's true that God's presence is here waiting for us to recognize it. Because of that fact, we want to learn as a church family, how do we encounter the presence of God? How do we engage him? How do we know him? How do we prepare ourselves for him? So here's what we're asking the Father to do <clears throat> over this next month, that he would increase our thirst for him, that we would recognize our deep need for him so he would increase our thirst. He would increase our preparation and our pursuit of him, that we would actually learn to like till the soil of our heart to prepare our hearts for his seed of truth, All right? So we would be ready when he shows up and that he would increase the impact on our world when we, as his people, as his children, minister out of the overflow that comes from having encountered him, right? That the world would be blessed by our encounter with God. 
All right, so that's what we're asking God to do. And so last week, uh, we looked to lay a biblical foundation for what does it mean to pursue God? So I had two main points out of last week. The first one was, we are created for the presence of God. I don't know if you knew that. That we are actually created for his presence. It is written into the code of us that we are to uh, encounter the presence of God. That's what we are created for. So encountering the presence of God is not just for the, the religious zealot or the super Christian or the really intense person or, you know, so it is for all that God has created. All of humanity is made for it, designed to encounter the presence of God. Uh, Dallas Willard, uh, after meditating on this passage, then the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed breath into him, right? After he reflected on that, he said, the two sides of the great human contradiction, dust and divinity, then are set in place. We are created as human beings. We are created from the dust. There is a very organic, uh, very human uh, aspect to our being. And at the same time, God breathed and imparted himself to us. So there is this other spiritual side of our being, right? So he says that great contradiction happened because of what God did in Genesis chapter two. So that is why just like we are able to interact with the physical world around us, God has designed us to interact with him spiritually as well. So last week we also saw uh, not only that we are created um, for the presence of God, the people of God uh, pursue the presence of God. Part of what our job is, our responsibility is as the people of God is to get after him, is to seek after God, is to pursue him. And this was, uh, this is not just unique to those that really love God a lot that they're going to pursue his presence. This is the job description for all of the people of God is to pursue him. That's why Moses, he asked God, would you show me your glory? And that's why God was willing to uh, show Moses his glory. He shared himself with him. And Moses had walked with God. He'd talked with God. He'd seen God's miracles. He'd received like the commandments of God. He had seen God deliver them from Egypt. But he said, God, above all of that, what I want is you. And we realized that this wasn't unique to Moses, that all throughout redemptive history, the people of God, uh, it is appropriate for them to be hungry and want to taste and see that God is good. It is the pattern of God's people to pursue his presence, not simply his benefits, but to say, God, I want to see your glory. And so then the last thing that we did last week was to really lay the foundation for this conversation, this teaching over the next month, and we wanted to define our terms. So I'm saying things like encountering the presence of God. What does that mean? And it could mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. So uh, I gave us a definition of what does it mean for us to encounter the presence of God? What am I talking about? Well, this is specifically what we're talking about, where God makes himself known to our spiritual senses, and then we align ourselves with him, right? So it starts out with God. He's making something known, and he's designed us to encounter, to experience, to know, Right, So we then, uh, he makes himself known to our spiritual senses and then we respond accordingly. We then align ourselves with him. And so this morning, here's what I wanna do. This morning, my goal is that since this is true, since God has created you for his presence and since the people of God pursue the presence of God, what I want to know, what I want to, what I want to fan into flame is something that I believe that lies within you, and that is that you are hungry, that you are longing to encounter God. That your hearts will never find rest until they find rest in his presence. You are made for it. You might not be aware of that, but you're designed for it. That you are longing for the presence of God. I believe that you are made to encounter God and deep down you are longing for it, but 
What I want you to know this morning is that you are not alone in that desire, that you are not by yourself in wanting to encounter God. While you deep down desire God, God deep, deep down desires you because he's a God who pursues. That's what we're gonna look at this morning is that redemptive history hits this refrain over and over and over again, is the God that created all things is a God that pursues you. And we gotta know that storyline. And I think sometimes the reason that we don't want to open ourselves up to the reality of encountering the presence of God is that we might actually be disappointed. We might be afraid that it's all not all that we hope to be, or we might be afraid that we're gonna be giving up control to this God who is in pursuit of us. But my desire this morning is to unlock and increase your desire for God by looking at five scenes. <clears throat> I'm not attempting to be comprehensive, but I'm gonna look at five scenes that tell the story of a God who pursues and so the way we're gonna do that is a little bit unique. I got the worship team's gonna stay up here with me. They're gonna actually participate in the teaching so that as we go through each of the scene, we will pause and we're gonna reflect on what is that scene showing us about God? And the worship team is gonna help us uh, to be able to do that. And Pastor Chris is gonna help us to be able to reflect on each of those uh, five scenes that will identify the longing of a God who pursues. And with each scene, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to see how is it that God is making himself known to our spiritual senses and how is it that we are aligning ourselves with him. And in a few minutes, I'll dismiss the treasure seekers. They're gonna hang out with us for the first two scenes uh, of the five scenes we're gonna look at. All right, you ready for that? Let's pray. Jesus, help us. Help us to give the scope of what you're doing. Help us to see a God who is tenacious, who is relentless in pursuit of his people. I think often, God, we just simply don't know you very well. And so I would ask that you would open our eyes so that we would get to see this God who is pursuing his people. In your name I pray, Jesus, amen. So our first scene is scene one in the garden where this scene opens and it's dark. In fact, it actually tells us that, that, that it was formless and void. It was without shape. There was chaos and then something happened and we called it the beginning. And in the beginning, God. In the beginning, before anything else, above all else was God. And then at the beginning, God spoke and worlds came into being. Cosmic, superpower, declaring life, giving shape, giving order. The God who speaks solar systems and they have patterns. <clears throat> Excuse me the God who creates butterflies and they have beauty. He imagined, then he created. That is the God we meet in Genesis chapter one. But then we turn the page to Genesis chapter two. And this cosmic deity gets very close to one of his creations. And into that one, he breathes himself when we find out that Adam and Eve are the people that God, want to be, God wants to be with. God pursued time with Adam and Eve. Now here's how we know that God pursued time with Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter three, it says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God had visited them so often that when they heard him, they knew what it was. It's like, oh, that, that's, that's the sound of God walking with us. Because that's when God shows up so God has gotten very close. He has pursued his creatures to the point that they know what it's like. They know the sounds of him drawing near. The same eternal God that had spoken the world into existence 
also humbled himself to get very close to his creatures with such consistency that they anticipated him, that they knew what it was like for God to show up. And so God revealed himself to their spiritual senses. And then what was it that Adam and Eve had to do in order to align themselves with God getting close? Well, we find that out here also. We find it out in the negative. Because in this story, sin had entered the world. So when God was showing up, what did they say to do? Now we need to hide. So the expectation for Adam and Eve when God was to draw close was not to hide, but to simply be present. God's design for them was that he would pursue them and they simply would be present with him. But because of sin, they hid themselves. And so before we move on to scene number two, I wanna just pause on the tremendous truth of Genesis chapter one, two, and three, that there is this God who created all that we see also wants to get very close and be present with his people. So let's pause there for a moment and Pastor Chris is gonna lead us into reflecting on that truth. So we're gonna do just a, a short little exercise of reflection here on this one. And it's called a high-low. Anybody ever done one before? Okay, so you're looking for a high point and a low point. So considering this verse of, of Genesis 3, early on before the fall, when they would hear the sound of the Lord walking in the garden, they would spend time with him. They would talk with them. They had fellowship with God in that moment. So I want you to think about a high time like that. When's the time where you knew you were walking with the Lord? Think about that. Just get it in your mind. I have you write it down. There's pins in the seats too. And then the low moment would be similar to verse eight here where they heard God, but then they hid themselves. They ran away from him. So I want you to get one of each of those, a time where you knew you were walking with God, where you sensed you were close to him, and a time where you've hidden yourself away from his presence. Go ahead and take a moment and write those down, or at least get them in your mind. sing this next song. I'm going to want you to imagine the high in one hand and the low in the other. Bring them both before the Father and ask him to speak to you and to be near you. Invite him into the low. Celebrate the high. So let's stand together. We're going to sing this song together and pray over those things in our lives.
scene two you can have a seat and in scene two uh, it is a result of the failure uh, for Adam and Eve to maintain or to be present with God as God was pursuing presence with them right and it said what what was the consequence in the day you eat of it you will surely what die and so we learn in Genesis chapter three what death means is to be separated from, from the presence of the Father. That you're cut off from, from the living water. So they are sent out of the garden. And so to darkness in a sense, not complete, but to darkness, they return. And so Adam and Eve have died, sent away from the manifest presence of God. Yet we have a God whose inclination is to be with his people and he is relentless in his pursuit. So God pursues, God sends Noah, God sends Abraham, God sends Moses, God sends the law, God sends the prophets. And so scene number two, the one I'm going to pick uh, I could have picked from a number. I'm going to pick the tabernacle uh, is the picture here. So scene number two is the tabernacle. We get detailed instructions 
for scene number two in Exodus 26 of what the tabernacle is. And if you remember, what the tabernacle is, is uh, what God would, what God used so that he would, what does God wanna do? He pursues his people. He wants to be present with his people. So he is going to be present among his people. And so as his people wander, right, in the desert, God's presence is with them in the form of fire, right, or the form of smoke, and his presence would be in the tabernacle, literally in the middle of his people. So his people would encamp around him, and God's presence would be there. And then God gave all of these very detailed laws of what does it mean to to have the presence of God in the middle of a group of people. And they were to eat certain things and they were to dress a certain way and they were to live among or around the presence of God so that the world looking at the people of Israel would see that is a people of that God. And we're gonna get to know that God by looking at those people. And so God laid out all of those things. And a lot of times we read all of the detailed descriptions through like the book of Leviticus is like, oh my goodness, God, why did you make it so hard to be near you? And we think what God is doing is setting up all of these different hoops because he doesn't really want the people near him and they gotta get themselves right, but that's not the truth. God is actually being extravagant in his graciousness because this is a group of people who have rejected him. And so now we see as God pursues his people, he sets up all of these standards because he wants the people to get as close to him as possible. So he's gonna give them the sacrificial system. Why? Because he knows they're gonna fail again. And so as long as they're willing to humble themselves and say, God, I can't do this on my own, and I demonstrate that through this this sacrificial act, as long as they're willing to humble themselves, they are able to dwell as close to the presence of God as possible so that God could dwell among his people. So how did God make himself known to their spiritual senses? Very clearly, Right? And, and, and it's bloody and it's extravagant, but it's just as close as he could get his people to the holiness of his presence. And this isn't just true in the tabernacle. This was also true of the temple. This was true of the, the Davidic covenant that was made and the promises God made to Solomon and, and the return for the exiles. And there was this curtain in the tabernacle and in the temple that would separate the people from the holiness of God's presence. And there would be access to the holiness of God, but it was limited. And so God was setting up all of these things to say, I want my people close. I will make provision for them to be close to me. So this morning, in our second scene, we're gonna do a similar thing of as God draws near, if we are willing to humble ourselves, and we are willing to offer him a sacrifice so that we can acknowledge him by faith, we can demonstrate his presence, so we can, we can uh, humble ourselves before him. That was the requirement for the people. Like God knew after scene number one that the people would fail. So in scene number two, he's willing to make provision for their failure. And so God is still willing to make provision for our failure if we humble ourselves before him. And so Pastor Chris is gonna come and lead us in an exercise that is designed for our humility. So one of the things that carries over from the Old Testament that Jesus affirmed was tithes and offerings. So you only have what you have because of the provision of the Father. If he wasn't gracious and generous, we would have nothing. So whether you have two cents or some other dollar figure, when we give tithes and offerings, Let's do that with humble and gracious hearts. Because without his goodness, we're just clawing at whatever we think we're chasing. So I'm going to have our ushers come. They're going to take these tithes and offerings. 
And while it is also a moment where we humble ourselves and give from humble hearts, it's also a call to praise the Father who has given us such great things. So I want to make sure that we keep that in the right spirit and the right heart. So as you give, give in a way that praises the Father. So Jesus, thank you for these tithes and offerings. Without your goodness, we wouldn't have anything to offer. So let this be a reminder of where our hearts are and that our hearts are humble before you today. So receive these tithes and offerings, God, as a way of us saying thank you to you. Praise your name. Amen. Please stand with me and sing.
So David says in Psalm 27, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Right, so, so the people of God were getting to know that there is a God who pursues, a God who wants to be with them, right? So we saw that in scene one, and then what we saw in scene two with the tabernacle is that God recognized the failure of the people and was willing to make provision so that they could be as close as possible to him. And what God asked of them was simply to align themselves. He didn't ask for them to be perfect, he didn't say, in order to be with me, you must be perfect. He actually assumes their imperfection. That's why he makes the provision of the sacrificial system. He says, I call you to be in my presence. To be in my presence means that you must be perfect, and you're not, so I make provision for you. So all they had to do was humble themselves before God, and guess what? At that, they we failed again. So, remember, we serve a relentless God, and so that moves us on to scene number three, where God in the fiery presence just wasn't clear enough. God veiled behind the temple curtain wasn't clear enough. And so John 1, 14 says, and the word became flesh and tabernacled and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So this time, instead of the presence of God dwelling in some location, in some building, the presence of God put on skin and moved into the neighborhood. God got very close and he tabernacled. It's the same Greek word as what happened in the Old Testament. He dwelt among us. He became a man for a single purpose. He became a man sent from God to rescue man back to God. So Jesus came because we were so corrupt that we weren't even able to say, God, forgive me, God, I need you. So Jesus had to come to save us from ourselves. And here's what's amazing is he brought with him the new covenant. And we celebrate the new covenant uh, every time we take communion together. And the new covenant, the new covenant terms uh, are the cup and the bread, right? The bread is the broken body of Christ and the cup is the shed blood of Christ. So the broken body is, uh, his body is broken so ours doesn't have to be. And his blood is shed, why? It's terms of the new covenant. It is to purify. And when God purifies us, he makes us fit to be in his presence. So Jesus' work is a rescue mission. All right, let me pause for a moment. I wanna dismiss treasure seekers. Sorry, guys. So you can head on back out. Parents, if you haven't signed your children up for Treasure Seekers, please follow them out and do so, and we can collect them after the service in the cafe. And one of the amazing things that happened at the sacrifice of Jesus, three of the four Gospels record this event, is that the temple curtain is torn from top to bottom, as if God just reaped, reached down and ripped it in half and said, now the presence of God is no longer housed in this facility. It is now present with you. And so Jesus led a rescue mission. So how did God make himself known to their spiritual senses? He showed them himself in the form of a man. Jesus walked among them. And then how is it that the people were to align themselves 
Well, the way that they aligned themselves was by faith. To as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of, of, of like the human will, but born of God, because God had made himself available to them in the form of Jesus. I love the way John talks about this experience of God in his epistle, 1 John 1, 1 to 3. And it's like he can't talk about his encounters with God enough. So he says, that which was from the beginning, which we, we've heard it, we've seen it with our eyes, we've looked upon it, we've touched it with our hands concerning the word of life. That life, in case you missed it, it was made manifest. We've seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen, that which we've heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship, our time together, our koinonia is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus. So in scene number three, we see once again the relentless work of God to pursue his people and to address their vulnerability and their failure to maintain relationship with him. And this time he does it in the person of Jesus as one who would come and rescue a people for God. So we're going to take a minute. I'm going to show you a declaration of faith that goes along with what the Apostle John was trying to say. The Apostle Paul actually penned these words for us in the Philippian church. So I'm going to read them through once, and then I'll have you stand, and we'll read them together. So go ahead with the next slide, you guys. This is, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's an example of how he pursues us, what he did in his pursuit. So would you stand with me? We're going to read that whole thing again. We're going to make this a declaration in this room this morning. So we're going to start those slides over, you guys. Let's read this together. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father.
about scene four, why don't you have a seat? Scene four builds directly on scene three, and hopefully you're seeing how scene three is a response to both God's initiative of what he wanted in the tabernacle and also the failure of the people to be able to retain the glorious presence of God. And that is a response to scene one where God stepped onto the stage and say, I want, I'm a God who pursues my people, right? And so God pursues his people uh, Adam and Eve fail in being able to retain the, the joy of that presence and they are sent out and then, and then God makes provision in the tabernacle and again, the people are stiff-necked and unwilling to humble themselves, but God is unwavering in his commitment for his people. So he sends his son Jesus to rescue, to deliver, to make provision so that God's people can be with the Father. And that leads us on to what happens after the death and ascension of Jesus, which is seen for the day of Pentecost. Now, I don't know how many of you know this, but today is Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost is uh, the Greek word for 50th. Um, and so uh, it is the 50th day after the Easter celebration. Um, it's also known, this goes all the way back into Exodus, uh, where it was uh, called the Festival of the Weeks because it was seven weeks uh, after the Passover. And if you remember during the Passion Week, that was Passover week. Um, and so this is, this is the day of Pentecost. And the, and the festival of the weeks was a feast that was celebrating the harvest, right? So there were certain harvest days, uh, certain harvest seasons. And so this was celebrating a harvest. And then you know um, from Acts chapter two, there's going to be a significant harvest uh, that happens in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost. And so that's where uh, Luke picks up the story here uh, in Acts chapter two. And this is the first mention in the New Testament of this uh, particular, uh, I'm sorry, this is the first mention in the New Testament uh, of this ceremony. And on this occasion, there's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples of Jesus, which is an event that many would, uh, of us would consider. This is the birth of the, of the New Testament church. So all these people had gathered because it's a required uh, one of, I think it's three festivals that are required for the Jews to come together in Jerusalem. And so they're there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And so Luke's narrative opens with a brief mention that they're all gathered uh, in this place on the day of Pentecost. And then the story picks up. It says, and suddenly, and suddenly, the Spirit of God came on them. And his coming was accompanied by three signs. There was a sound, there was a sight, and there was strange speech. So first, there came from heaven the sound like the blowing of a violent wind. And the noise, it, it, it filled up the whole house where they were sitting. And then secondly, there appeared to them visibly what seemed to be like tongues of fire on the individuals that were there in the house. And then thirdly, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and, and evidence of that spiritual work was they were uttering tongues that they weren't able to speak previously, that they were able to share truth that God had enabled them through his spirit. So God makes himself known to their spiritual senses in three ways, sound, sight, and these words. And these three experiences, they might seem like natural phenomenon, but they were not natural in their origin. The text makes that clear. This is something that God was doing. And it says that it was a, a sound like a wind and it was like a fire. It resembled it. And so God was doing a, a significant thing. He, again, God was pursuing his people. And then immediately they start asking the question that many of you might be asking is, why did God do that? What, what do these things mean? 
And I think we can allow the other parts of scripture to help guide our interpretation of what did these things mean on Pentecost Sunday in Acts chapter two. And what we've come to understand is that God has been in pursuit of his people. And so God, as the spirit in Genesis chapter one would hover and he would bring disorder to order, God, like a mighty wind, was hovering over his people to form a people for himself. And then just like in the tabernacle and in the temple, the presence of God was represented by fire. In the new covenant, the presence of God wouldn't be residing in some building. It would be residing in the hearts and lives of individuals that make up the church of Jesus. And so God's presence was dwelling on his people. And then as God would dwell on his people, he would empower them for a new way of being alive, for them to be able to walk in things that previously they were unable to. The terms of the new covenant actually say that God would unite our hearts to fear his name alone, that we would actually be able to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and left to ourselves, we can't do that on our own. We need the spirit of God dwelling inside of us to bring us to life and then to be able to walk in new patterns. That's the new covenant. That is God pursuing a people and God saying, I recognize that you lack the capacity on your own to live in my presence. So what I will do is make it possible for you. I will dwell inside of you. And as you release the power, as you release the authority, as you release the control, I will grow in my influence. I will fill you up is the New Testament term, that we would be filled with the spirit of God. God ever increasing in his influence in our lives. What we call that theologically is sanctification. So God's work wasn't localized in a building, but he decided now to go underground and start filling his people with his presence. So because of the new covenant, because of the extravagant work of Jesus and the temple being, the temple curtain being torn in two and the presence of God being released, it now would reside in his church. And by doing so, he is empowering our obedience to live in the joy of his presence. God doesn't wanna just take up residence in your life. God wants to increase his influence in your life as he would dwell among and in his people. So that day of Pentecost came out of Jesus' people responding in obedience to go and wait and to pray. So we're going to do that this morning. We're going to give you some time to wait and to pray. And just like we read out of the Christ song where it said, every knee bowed and every tongue confessed that Jesus is Lord, you might want to take this time and come to the altar and bow your knee. Because what I want you to pray is this. I'm going to have you guys put that up there, okay? I want you to pray, God, increase your presence in my life. Now, hear this very carefully. This is not a time for you to pray for God to do something in somebody else. Like, God, let your presence show up in so-and-so, or let this happen so-and-so. This is for you to ask God to fill you with his spirit, that his presence would be in your life. So if you would like to come and bow your knee and let your tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, I don't care if you speak English, Spanish, Ukrainian, whatever they speak in Pakistan or wherever your nationality is from, if you want to pray that way, pray. You have that freedom to do that in this place. So we're going to give you some time to wait and to pray, but pray, God, increase your presence in my life. And you can add whatever else you want to add there. But if you'd like to come and kneel and do that, encourage you to make your way up here and then we'll close in a time of prayer after we wait a little bit but go ahead and come on
Transform our hearts to be hearts that chase after you, that mirror the way that you've pursued us. The way we live and the way we do life, God, would it be infused with your Holy Spirit. Mark out our steps for us. Continue to form us into the image of your Son. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the final scene is the scene that every other scene has been building towards. When God finally achieves what has been the expressed longing of his heart, a heart of a, of a God who has been pursuing his people, And he showed us his heart as almighty God pursued closeness in the garden. He he demonstrated his willingness to remove obstacles in order to dwell among his people in the tabernacle. He showed us his passion when Jesus rescued people for God in the incarnation. And he revealed his plan to dwell in the hearts of his people at the day of Pentecost. And then in the fifth and final scene, there'll be nothing partial. There'll be nothing uh, unfulfilled. There'll be nothing left on the table. God makes himself known not just to our spiritual senses, but he will make himself known to all of our senses. And we will joyfully align ourselves entirely with him. Every thought every affection, every pattern of behavior, every inclination, always and forever to the glory of God. Imagine it. Wow. So this is what he was revealing to us in the garden. This is, this is what the tabernacle was pointing to. This is what the prophet Ezekiel was writing about uh, in the Old Testament. When he said, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst Forever. All of the Old Testament prophets point to the future hope of one people with God. Jesus, as he was about to depart uh, and go through his, his, his passion week and, and go home to the Father, he was reassuring his disciples with these very same Promises. These disciples that uh, at this point were confused and disillusioned and they weren't yet filled with the spirit of God like what would happen in Pentecost where they would literally change the world. That hadn't happened yet. So they were frightened about the thought of Jesus leaving. And he said to them, <clears throat> let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, in my father's house, are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? But if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So Jesus is looking to that future day where we will finally be home. And in a moment, I'm gonna have you stand as I read scene number five. And it is a scene that John is given a sneak preview of. It is a scene that has not yet occurred in human history. It is a scene of what is to come. And so John writes it down for us, and it is the crescendo of human history, the ultimate victory of God, what God has been planning since before time began. Since before he stepped on the scene at the beginning and revealed himself as a God who pursues a people. 
and it is the culmination of a God who wins for our good and for his glory. But no longer will he just be with us in the cool of the day. No longer will there be restricted access of God behind the curtain. No longer will God be humble and hidden like in the incarnation. No longer will God be underground only dwelling in the hearts of his people like in the day of Pentecost. But our future will no, no longer be by faith. Our future will be fullness by sight in his presence. Will you please stand with me as I read to you Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away sing this with me Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Let's sing that again. Oh, praise the Praise His name forevermore. 
return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on jesus face oh, oh praise the name of the lord our god oh praise his name some things around us that you want to spend some time and just linger here for a while. Maybe just have a sense of his presence this morning and you're not ready to go. You have the freedom to just stay, to receive prayer, to sit and pray with each other. I'm also going to send our missions people out to the lobby. Uh, we have some Taste of Mission projects that happen in two weeks that we want to make sure that you get signed up for. So whenever you're ready, you can come and receive prayer or just take some time or you can head that way. Um, so let me just pray for us, and then you're free to move whichever way. The band's going to stay and linger a while if you're not ready to go. Uh, so feel free to take your time this morning. So Jesus, you've taken us on a journey. You've shown us so many different ways of how you're pursuing us. Because you really want the whole world to be back to like it was in the Garden of Eden before we ate from the tree. So God made that purpose. And may that intention of your will become something strong in us as a church. That this world, while it's under our watch as your people, would see transformation towards the kingdom of God like it was in the Garden of Eden happen all over the place. So start here with us in South Jersey. And may you continue to spread your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you guys. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're a living hope. Your presence.
Speak.